The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Page four of your notes, Roman numeral three. It is our custom to give everybody a few moments in which to be sure that you start off on the right foot, so to speak, that you are indeed in fellowship and filled with God the Holy Spirit so that you can benefit from the information communicated to you with regard to the life and times of Abraham and Sarah and the following patriarchs that uh, made such a singular contribution uh, under God to the advancement of the plan of God and the repercussions of their life is still with us uh, with regard to the descendants and the real estate. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are here under the royal imperative to grow in grace and knowledge. We pray that you'll bless this Bible class and contribute it to our appreciation of your perfect plan of which we are so privileged to be involved in. Be with us in our study, in Jesus' name, amen. The subject of uh, the promised land and the things I've been trying to tell you lately, I never thought I'd bring my phone into the pulpit, but I did but I'm not gonna read the article. I'm just gonna note, this was on that uh, Israel 365 news. Biden administration, cough, cough, tries to block Jerusalem from fulfilling prophecy of returning Jews to Israel, because that's helping Putin, oh man. <laughs> uh, then there's one called the Battle for the Temple Mount stair Stairs. Activity is stirred up there. With regard to the Temple Mount, it's not the actual Temple Mount. That's a, a fake Temple Mount. I mean, the Arabs have, uh, the Muslims have their golden, golden dome and then their other mosque over there uh, on that, what they call the Jews, Christians, and the Muslims call the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount could not possibly be there, but anyway, this is where, you, you can go online on, and see it on, you can see a uh, live video, you used to be able to anyway, of uh, people walking up to this so-called wall and the Jews, for instance, going up there. And uh, when we were there, Brenda and I, uh, the men were on one side and the women were on the other side. And they go up there and they pray and they'd, uh, they'd put little scriptures in written form into the cracks in the rock. And uh, the uh, Temple Mount, uh, Jesus made it very clear that when the Romans destroyed what is commonly called, but not accurately called, the second temple, that uh, not one stone would be left on top of another. You remember that was in, that was in his discourse on the, on the Mount of Olives. Looking, looking east and you could see the beautiful temple the disciples were so excited about, because it was beautiful, it was gorgeous. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was absolutely, just from an architectural standpoint, magnificent. And uh, uh, so if that's the Temple Mount, all these stones are on top of each other. We all know that they're from the Roman era. This was the Roman fortress. This is the fortress where the Roman garrisoned their soldiers uh, to keep order and everything in the, in the client state of Judea. Rome ruled over it. And uh, that's where the soldiers were. They had, they had shopping there. They had all the things a soldier needs. So that is, that's the Fort Antonia, which was not tore down, and the Romans wouldn't tear down their own fort. And Jesus said not one stone would be left on top of another. And these stones, working down to the foundation, were massive. It's not like any stone building probably you've seen. These were many tons, and the Romans raised that thing to the ground. Even though their general wanted them to back off. They went in a frenzy. They fulfilled prophecy. The real, the real temple was south of there, 
on, the, on that grassy knoll about, I don't know, uh, a couple of football fields lengths away. So if there's any problems in the temple, the Romans could just jog, the soldiers could just jog down there and deal with it. And they did from time to time and shed some Jewish blood. So again, it's the wrong place. But it is the place under contention today with the Muslims and the Jews believe that this is where they need to build this temple that they're all ready to, to, to get rolling with because they've got all the, all, everything ready to go. All they need is the green light. So what I'm expecting is a big blow up with the Palestinians big time, likes of which we haven't seen. Not a bunch of rockets being shot. In. I mean, wiping them out and the Jews taking over that, that spot and building the tribulational temple. So keep watching for that. And uh, then this one last article, Biden administration sneaks in funding for Palestinian state and program to delegitimize Israel. And then there's an article on, and you can go to it if you want to. Uh, that's, uh, that's 365, Israel 365, but beware, beware. The Jews talk about Bible prophecy and the prophecies being fulfilled as in the example of the Ukrainian Jews coming back. And that's true. But it's always what you ignore. I wonder what they do with these verses that we just covered in Ezekiel, where God is speaking with regard to the land and categorizing the Gentiles as uh, uh, bad-mouthing the whole idea and rubbing it in to the Jews who came into their country in captivity Oh, uh, you're the chosen people and the promised land and all this business. I wonder what the Jews think, the, why they got kicked out. Uh, we'll take the most recent example of 70 AD. I'm sure they've got some goofy answer. They were kicked out of the land because in the land they disobeyed God and it was told through the law of Moses that the worst form of discipline that could be administered to them was that they would be exiled and dispersed among the nations. That was the threat. If you don't pull your horns in at the last minute and turn back to me and, and the truth, then, then I'm kicking you out of the land and I'll use some of those nasty Gentiles to do it. And that happened three times in their history. I wonder what they do, especially with the verse that says where they're scattered and it's not for any righteousness in you that I'm getting you back. I mean, they twist, it's like everybody else, they twist everything. And that's because, and also, you have profaned my name among the nations. What are the chosen peoples among, uh, primarily, they were to be a priest nation to the Gentile nations and any positive volition that was out there among the Gentiles and to set an example and to, and to, and to allow Gentiles to travel to Israel and worship in the temple if they so chose. There's a whole psalm devoted to that. I don't know which one it is off him. And there were seeking Gentiles in antiquity who traveled to Israel because they were positive and were fed up with their idolatry. So, of course, the Gentiles all drew the conclusion that their God wasn't able to deliver them and there, this whole idea of a promised land uh, in the extreme uh, uh, is, all poo is just junk. When you understand the word of God, you know that they were dispersed for, re for cause, for sin, rebellion. They had a good history of it. And yet, the Jewish people descended from Abraham, brought us the Messiah. There were enough good ones, in-line ones, and the others were just useful idiots, if anything, or just idiots, that made this all happen. God knew beforehand that they'd be far from perfect, this side of the millennium. And the latest dispersion of the Jews among the nations has run for close to 2,000 years. Well, 1988 or so years. If you count from 70 AD, when the Romans 
knocked down the temple, took the Jews in the land, and drug them into captivity. There's a, there's a depictation of it. You can type it in. Titus, he was the general in charge of the Roman legions. He was the general, later became Caesar. And it's called Titus's Arch. And you can see him with paraffin on that carved into the rock, this depictation of the Jews being led off into captivity. Jesus gave the Jewish believers, Christians of the church age, a heads up. He said, when you see the Roman legions forming up, you get out of the land so you're not ravaged by being drug off, uh, led off, uh, not in a nice way. They're not, they're not, that's not going to be a humanitarian way of dragging people off. They're not concerned if you can't walk, if you aren't strong enough, if you have whatever is going on because you're old or whatever. It was brutal. The Romans fought the Jews for two years before they finally the Jews finally succumbed and fought. The last, the last holdout, a bunch of them got up on top of Masada, south of Israel, a high cliff area. and fought, and when they realized they couldn't make it, they all jumped off the side and committed suicide. That was their last stand. The prophets said this would happen. Jesus said this would happen. The apostles said this would happen. And it happened. In compliance with the fifth cycle doctrine in, in Leviticus, in the Old Testament times, Back then, it was always because of gross practice of idolatry, incorporating the, uh, uh, the Baals and the Molochs and all those, those, those fake deities. Not fake because they didn't believe that they existed, it's fake because they don't exist. Anyway. So, you and I were born in fortunate times in the time when the, when the green light was given and the Jews began to trickle back into the land and reestablish a presence in the land of promise. The land of promise is always the land of promise. It isn't promised to anybody else and not the Palestinians who think it's theirs and not our government or anyone else that's pro-Palestinian. They're squatters. <laughs> They're squatters. Wherever they should live, it isn't in that land. And so this is going to re result in a battle and, until someone can show me different. I think the Palestinians are descendants of Esau. They're the house of Esau. Whereas the other Muslims that live there, Arabs, they're from Ishmael, the, other, the son of Abraham. Which we'll get to. It all comes together. It's all coming together. And the average person out there is clueless as they can be, including these uh, Christians. How many churches could you go to that are fundamentalist oriented and hear an explanation of the doctrine of the United States and prophecy? The detail of it. Now, I saw one funding group that said, yeah, the U.S. is going to be destroyed. But they didn't say who's going to do it. Well, the Lord's going to do it. Obviously, he does things through others or directly. He has, he, has, he has an instrument that he uses to judge something. Or he does it directly. Without any intermediary. The intermediary for America's destruction is what's in the news today. With all the hysteria with regard to Putin. Putin even, you know, and, and, and in our country, forget it. Just look at yourself as living in a regime, under a regime that is cranking out propaganda 24-7 about everything, just about. And if you want to believe this and run with it, then that's your business. I can't do anything about it, but tell you that this is the refuge of lies. 
And it's been this way. It didn't just start with this administration. <laughs> We've been going astray for a long, long time. Things maybe I used to support in the past, I don't support anymore. I mean, they're, they're past history. But if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't have supported them. No, I'm not going to wave my flag and say, yeah, this is what we ought to be doing. Especially when it was cooked up and schemed behind the scenes. And those who did that are traitors. Asking men to go out and put their lives on the line and lie about it and make, and make, make up a situation. And then when we get into the situation, we're not going to win it. So what the hell do we do it for? We didn't stop communism in Southeast Asia. There was more people murdered after we pulled out of there than you can even imagine. Our founding fathers said, stay out of foreign affairs. If nations want to fight each other and have a dictator, that's their business. We're not the policemen of the world. But we are today. We run all over the place. We've got presence a, pre a presence all over the place. Spending our money, meddling in their affairs, overthrowing governments, having bio labs all over the damn place. 336 of them. Oh, we're just trying to we're just trying to help people in the area to keep them and help them in case it, in case they got to fight anthrax or something. Really? They're smart enough over there to do their own bio study of viruses. But we got a presence, and it's sinister as it can be. A whole bunch of them in Ukraine. So here we are. The United States is at the end of its rope. And it's going to continue to do what it's been doing right up to the end. There's a verse regarding this, our prophecy of our country. It says, God said, I would have healed Babylon, but she will not be healed. But that would have taken the volition of a, of a significant percentage of born-again believers positive to turn to the Lord and, and all this away from all this business. But it ain't going to happen. We've already been told up front. So all these fundies say, pray for America. What are you going to pray for? What I pray for is just keep us going so we can have Bible class to the rapture. Food, shelter, and basic get us to get us to the end of this, this game, this dispensation. I want to, I wanted, uh, I, uh, I ended the, if you weren't here because you weren't here, <laughs> uh, uh, at the end of at the uh, end of the our annual business meeting, I pointed out something that I'm sticking by, and that is that every Jewish feast, a major prophetic fulfillment was will be realized on those feast days, in, as they symbolize certain things. Well, we know what Passover is, Christ, and it's coming up. The Jews will be celebrating it. I celebrate Passover with a couple of Jewish people in Oklahoma because they were briefing us on our trip to Israel. A nice Jewish couple with a couple of kids. That was nice. They read scripture. We had roast beef, I guess. I don't remember. She had the wrong dessert, but she had to do something else. I remember that because it wasn't kosher. It was okay. I didn't have a problem with that. Anyway, uh, that, that Christ, Christ went to the cross on Passover, not some other day of the year. It could have been absolutely guessed at that. I, I think people actually figured out that was that had to be then. And then first fruits, Sunday, resurrection. And then 50 days later, day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. 50 days later, the church age started. In 33 AD. Now we go over to the fall or summer fall because it's late summer and moving close to fall feasts of which there's three. First fruits, first fruits, trumpets, day of atonement, 
tabernacles. I'm betting that the rapture is tied to trumpets. And that starts, and then and when that hits, and we're out of here, the age of Israel resumes. It's like a pause button. God actually paused it in 33 AD, and uh, then, then the age of Israel starts again. Once this rapture event occurs, no one here can comprehend the magnitude of this event and the impact that it will have socially on this country and elsewhere, but especially on this country with all the missing persons and empty graves. It's just going to be, it's going to be a knockout blow practically for the United States. You got all these people missing and you don't just replace them. Military, police, businesses, key people, employees, they're gone. And then an angel picks up that stone that the Statue of Liberty sat on, because it's round. He picks it up and makes a speech and throws it in the deepest part of the Atlantic and says, Babylon's going down. Just as you'll never recover this, you're never going to recover. This country won't recover. Can you imagine the shock waves that go through all this country from the top to the bottom when this hits? And then those announcements out of heaven that the whole world will hear? The gospel? Don't take the mark of the beast and get yourself out of Babylon, U.S. of A., so you don't die here. It's all in Revelation 7, 18. It's all right in there. And, the, and, the, and John, who wrote this down, he couldn't have understood all that. He just did his job, inspired, I wrote down. Prophets didn't understand everything they wrote down because it, ha it happened way off down the line. So I haven't figured out, for instance, <clears throat> I know who the bear is. <coughs> I haven't figured out what the significance of rising up on one side. Usually if we think of a bear in full mode, he's either on all fours or he's raised up like this. But raising up on one side with three ribs in his mouth that tell him to rise and devour a bunch of flesh. The bear is Russia. The flesh is the wiping out of those that are in the United States when this happens. That's just, that's just the immediate death toll of Americans that will not leave here. They'll all die. Immediately or collaterally with radiation. They'll all breathe it in. They'll all die. This is, this is a serious judgment. The only, to wipe out a country of this magnitude and then to make its landmass forbidden for occupation or even exploration is quite amazing. So we, we've been piling our sins up to heaven. And when it reaches the point God knows, using the metaphor of the building of the Tower of Babel, when it reaches that top point, that's when Russia will unload its thermonuclear arsenal. Land-based, subs, and the rest. So the news is out in the angelic conflict. Where individuals and nations pay for their sins. Eventually. And the Christians aren't helping in this country because they're not acting like the salt of the earth. Okay. The test of Abraham and Sarah's faith and the promise of descendants. Divine intervention. Now back up on what he said to Abraham, God, the Lord. I'm going to make you a great nation. And in your, in your seed, all, nations of the, all families and nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the promise of the coming Messiah, and he understood that that meant the eventual appearance of the Messiah. It didn't mean that his wife was going to give birth to the Messiah. That, would not have been, that, would, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> they weren't even a nation yet. It was just Abraham and Sarah. A man and a woman. 
right man, right woman. Just those two. This fantastic announcement that I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of heaven, like the dust of the earth, and I'm going to give you the land that you're walking around in. It's not yours now. The only thing Abraham owned there, he bought a parcel of land for a burial place for the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives. That they would be buried there. I went to the tomb of the patriarchs. It's, it's in the ancestral home of the Jews, Hebron, south of Jerusalem. I walked in there. That's where they're buried. That's one site I think is uh, on archaeology or a, a, a tourist site uh, that was accurate. That's what they're going to be resurrected up out of as a group. That's where they were buried. So it's Abraham and Sarah. Now, normally Abraham would have heard the promise and say, I'm going to have a descendant that's going to carry on the line. No, I'm not going to. I, I'm not going to see a great nation in my lifetime, obviously. That's not practical. And then he got a prophecy that said, uh, your people at a certain point are going to go down to Egypt where they'll be enslaved and they'll come back up out of there. And I will judge the Egyptians that enslaved them and I'll bring them back to this land. And they will be victorious over the indigenous peoples, the Canaanites, the Amorites, and all those. Of course, they're not going to take it all at once. They're going to take it incrementally. Because if you had all that land, how could you occupy it if you don't have enough people? You have to have enough people, population, to grow and grow and grow. But under Joshua, they made great headway. Today, it's a relatively small country. And its impact in world history is way, out, way beyond its size. And the nations and the peoples of the earth have heard this. They're focused. They, they understand this. There are those that are pro-Israel and those that hate Israel. Like I said, the Jews... They're all, in this 365 thing, they're all talking about fulfilling prophecy and the Messiah's coming. They're right, but they don't know who he is. They do not know who he is. He's just somebody out there that's going to pop up, I guess. It's, it's really, it's sad. It's pathetic. And they, yet they've got the Old Testament. They don't need to know. They can work from it and figure out and then go and say, oh, that was Jesus. You can read Daniel and see how he'd be how he would come to his own and his own wouldn't accept him. And he would, have, he would be left with nothing. This is Christ ending his ministry. But what do you think that means? But you can't, you can't reason with negative volition on any of these topics. You can just forget it. You're cast in pearls. But there is going to be an awakening on the part of the Jews right after the rapture. Like It's going to be unbelievable. And we studied in the prophecy and in, in, in Matthew and the Olivet Discourse that the Jewish people in the land, and probably out too, but in the land are going to be highly polarized. Highly polarized. When a bunch of them start saying, yeah, we did. Our ancestors, we did as a people. Reject our Messiah. And it's what we did at the first advent. And we've been living under that, that, uh, that that was okay, but we're not now. We were wrong. We were dead wrong. Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. And that'll, that'll cause all kinds of friction. These rabbis over there, they are so screwed up, it's not funny. In so many ways. Of course they're pro-Israel. And they're pro-Palestinian, I mean, not they're, they're pro-Abrahamic covenant, but they don't understand who is at the center of it. Well, God, but wow. Now, so they go off on this great adventure, Abraham and Sarah. And 
Abraham's normal and their normal conclusion would be, we're going to have a son shortly. And he's going to be our heir, descendant. At least one child. We only need one. And it has to be a male. And they're young. Back then, 70 was young. Not that old. Considering Abraham lived to be, what, 175 or something? Sarah, Sarah, I say only, she only made it to 130. But people lived longer then. Anyway, so they're just thinking, you know, yeah, just we'll give it time, we'll faith rest it, and we'll have a child. But God is going to test them. And test them and also demonstrate to them that I will keep my part of the covenant. You've kept your part, left your relatives, wandered out into this great adventure of a promise that's just in paper, so to speak, words of descendants and real estate and a great nation and a lot of descendants. That was one meeting with God, one day in his life, minding his own business. He, didn't, he wasn't searching for this. Who, who would do that? All the factors involved in making this thing advance through the centuries. But he had faith. He walked by faith. God won't lie. I'm going to start off. Now, he's not a mature believer, but he's a positive believer. Sarah was barren throughout her childbearing years. Divine intervention wasn't some biological accident. Sarah was barren. She had no child. Genesis 1130. Abraham and Sarah sponsored two individuals as substitute heirs in lieu of having no natural son. So here we go. We got to help God. He expects us. He expects us. I can just hear it once part of people. He expects us to use our minds and resources and, 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 uh, so he, we're in this spot, so we're going to do something. Now, before they quit having relations and could have normal relations uh, of, of that kind, they sponsored two individuals as substitute heirs in lieu of having no natural child. Uh, son. Abraham sponsored as heir, one Eliezer, which suggestion we looked at earlier, God nixed it. He will not be the man. God isn't saying, look, when God's speaking to Abraham, it's not like, oh, now Abraham, some fundy. It's straightforward information. If Abraham's out of fellowship, you know what God's going to tell him? Stop being afraid. Not could you, would you? Stop it. So we saw in Genesis 15 that this was rejected by the Lord. Abraham had his idea. Eliezer was a good guy. But God, look, God does not run his plan on second class. It's first class. Things are first class. Top drawer. The best of the best. A natural heir. From those two people who were designated in time a new race. Hebrew. Brought out of the Semitic group. You're a Hebrew. You're a, you, you're a, I, I made you a distinct race. Only two of us. Doesn't matter. You're a distinct race. We're going to get more of them down here. Then there was Operation Hagar. This was pushed by Sarah. This was Sarah's grand idea. Sarah, Sarah, Operation Hagar was an attempt to produce an heir via a surrogate motherhood. And it produced Ishmael whom God 
Nix that one too. Genesis, Genesis 16. Now Sarai, that's her name before it got modified, Abram's wife had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. You bet he has. But for a positive reason, not to overthrow this covenant. Did they ever sit down and say, You know what? If this is real, God's going to have to make it happen between me and you. We're not going to do anything. There's a time when you don't do anything. You don't look for, okay, well, what will you do now? Adopt? Oh, I got this, I got this Egyptian maid. Uh, I want you to have sex with her. And that probably wasn't pleasant for Sarah. Wouldn't be for any normal woman to have your husband spend the night with another woman so you can have this son to adopt so you can make this thing work. <laughs> And yet you will notice that God let her do it. He didn't come down out of heaven and say, Sarah, you're way out of line. Because she was way out of line. She wasn't faith resting that God will uphold his end of something that he's promised. I don't care how bleak it looks. She was still at this point when this happened that she could have potentially had a child. But God closed her womb. He wanted to test him. And he wanted to show everyone else, I run this game. You don't. You are privileged to be a part of it and a participant, but you don't, you don't, you don't make anything happen. And if it comes down to a hopeless situation, I am the God who overrules the hopeless and turns it around. That's who we serve. Never forget that. So, perhaps I will obtain children through her. She's looking for more than one. Funny thing is, she only had one in her lifetime. But it was a really big deal. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. He's going to please his wife. Yeah, never mind. He's going to please his wife. Oh, I get to spend the night with her. She's kind of cute. And, 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 he's given, and she's given the green light. So you can imagine that that evening in the life of Sarah was miserable. As she sat there alone, slept in her bed alone, and her husband's over in this tent with this Sarah, uh, with, this, with this Hagar. See, it's what I call self-induced misery. You didn't need to do that. You took matters into your own hands to save the plan of God. <laughs> I have to laugh. Would I have done any different? Been a, throw, us, throw you in a situation where it just looks like this isn't, this isn't working. Surely God will bless us with one kid. Just one. I'd like to have more. A lot of women would. But I, I wanna, I'll be happy. Instead of saying, God is all powerful. So God's going to take them beyond the normal span, the upper and lower limits of childbearing. He's going to take them beyond that and then turn it around. Jesus Christ controls history, he controls all the biology, everything on the earth. I get really personally, I am so disgusted. I don't listen to him. I mean, I like to watch a nature show once in a while. Because I have some cool animals and stuff that God made. But then I have to listen to these jackasses. Tell me how many millions of years ago this, this thing came on the scene. What a crock. Where, how do we lose our minds and believe the impossible with man, with nature? You just leave stuff around long enough and it'll... Oh, there's a funny comedian on YouTube. Black guy is really funny. I can't do justice to it. He says, 
all these monkeys and apes said, somehow didn't make it. But he did it in such a funny way. It was hilarious. He was jamming this stuff through, somebody said, and I believe it, because I've been, back, I've, I've been around on, on the earth a while in America. True comedy is pretty much dead. It died with all this stupidity. Because you can't say anything. Can you imagine putting out a movie like Blazing Saddles today? Can you honestly imagine doing that? They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even write the script. And it wasn't against blacks. It's just funnier than hell. It really was laughable. The kind of comedians we had. We don't have that now. Not of that caliber. But see, we're in a cultural decline. It's affected all kind, a lot of the different aspects of our life, in spite of all our, the great technology. You know, this. I don't know how we survive without those. But we did. So, Abram lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. Abram's wife took, Abram's wife took, the wife, Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. Men could have more than one wife. Huh. You say, how do you do that? What, what, what do you do? You say, uh, Hagar, I, I have something for you today. The, the young woman, the young woman, what, what is she going to feel like? She's got an STA. She's got everything. I'm, I'm just being used. She may not have even been attracted to Abraham at all, even physically. I'm just going to be used. But being the slave girl that she was, she went along with it. He went into Hagar and she conceived. Boom. There's nothing wrong with Abraham's physiology. She's pregnant instantly. One session, and she conceived. When she saw that she conceived, maybe there's something else here. Maybe it's like, well, I'll have one up on Sarah. You have two people have STAs and aspirations. I'll have one, I'll have one up on Sarah. Sarah. When she realized she was pregnant, she got a bad mental attitude. Not what I was suggesting. Not, I just was used. No, 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 no. Her mistress was despised in her sight. So she's got an STA too. Everybody's STA is running around here, isn't it? And so she started treating. She, she did, probably did her chores, but she could see that. See, I, I, I've seen this with people around here over and over and over again. A change in attitude. A change in attitude. I don't judge it the minute I see it. Maybe you're having a bad day. Or maybe I did something to offend you. And if I did, and if I keep doing it, well, you just come in private and talk to me like you would any other Christian. But don't run around. Uh, I've seen it. But she, she, so she was despised in her sight. And so here's the electricity between Sarai and her maid, STA. And Sarah said to Abram, now she blames Abraham. <laughs> this, is, this is rich, isn't it? How twisted stuff gets. And Sarah said to Abram, may, may, this is, here, here, here's, your, here's your some domestic stuff uh, behind, the, <laughs> behind, the, behind the door, so to speak. May the wrong done to me be upon you. Whoa. I'm the victim. You sponsored this? But you, when you get a person under the STA, you can't reason with them. May the wrong, I gave my maid into your arms. But when she saw that she was conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between me and you, you and me. 
This is all STA. See, we get to see these. We get to see these great believers at some of their worst. We do. So much for believers always do the right thing. And nah, come on. And these, you know, these people at halos. No, 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 no. That STA is like regular people. And so they get into this thing. I can just imagine as the months wore on towards the birth, she'd walk by Sarah and put her hand on her stomach. <laughs> I could just imagine it. This is her chance to shine, Hagar. And Sarah just upped her workload. And so this friction continued until Hagar did a runaway. We'll pick this up tomorrow night. I hope you like it. I like it. I always like it. It's very stimulating. Well, I heard that before. Oh, really? Let well, me hear it again. Acclimate to the principle of authority. You'll be fine. If I'm not doing my job, God will deal with me. I have your best interests at heart. I do anything for you within reason that was biblical that you, you might need of any kind. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep if push came to shove. Know that. I didn't run when the wolf came yet, and I don't plan to. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying what I've done. I'm just like Paul did. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I will see you tomorrow. Everybody wear green. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name.